Hi everybody, I'm Tim Aubrey from DMAD Marine Mammals Research Association and welcome back to lecture 5 of our free series of lectures on QGIS. Today we're going to be looking at the vector data which we used in lecture 3 and 4 in greater detail. Please do keep liking, subscribing and most importantly sharing these videos so we can reach as many people as possible. Thanks, we'll dive straight in. Okay, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about vector data and our objective is to learn more about what vector data is, the different types of vector data and some of the problems that we can come across whilst we're using vector data. So first of all, I thought we'd start with a definition and this definition is off the QGIS website and as that's what we're studying for, I thought it was an apt definition. And it reads, vector data provides a way to represent real world features within the GIS environment. That is that our vector data are going to be a series of points, lines and polygons which show things from the real world within our GIS environment, within our mapping environment. Okay, so I thought in order to visualise this a bit more, we would use a tiny bit of Google satellite mapping and this is taken from BAR in Montenegro which is where we run our Montenegro Dolphin Research Project from and on this map we have our offices here and we have our volunteer accommodation up here and so the first thing we can do is we can begin to add point data so point data is things like lampposts, trees, uh, dolphins and anything that can be represented by a, a point in real life so just a single point and you can see here I have digitized the lamp posts which we have in our Google satellite so we have all the lamp posts there which are now represented by orange circles um, and point data is data that has one vertex and that just means that it has one set of coordinates uh, in this case because we're looking at a 2d image and we're working in 2d uh, that's going to be an x and y coordinate However, this could just as easily include a Z coordinate, especially in studies where you might be looking at uh, points where you've taken measurements from in mountains, or similarly if we have points like dolphins which might have an associated depth of the water. So the next type of data we've got is vector polyline data, or you may simply hear it referred to as line data. Um, and examples can include roads, so I've digitized all the roads here, um, but also we could have rivers, we could have boundaries to properties, we could have country boundaries, um, and lines or polylines are just simply a series of points which are joined. And therefore we've, we've got to have at least two vertices, so we've got to have two points for the start and end of our line as an absolute minimum. The next thing we're going to talk about is vector shape file data, sometimes called vector polygon data. And you can see that I've begun to digitize just a few of the buildings surrounding our offices and intern accommodation. But other examples might include land use, so we might have fields or roads or grassy areas, beach, that sort of thing um, vectorized as polygon data but it could also be protected areas, it could be buffer zones surrounding protected areas, um, and it could also be regions or even entire countries or entire groups of countries. So we've talked about points having one vertex and lines having a minimum of two vertex. Well, shape files or polygons have to have a minimum of four vertex or four vertices. Um, and you might think well what about a triangle surely that only has three vertices but actually if you think of the, th the three corners of a triangle then our first fourth vertex is where it rejoins the first point so if we just had three points we would just have two lines so our first point at the start of the line our second point at the end of our first line our third point at the end of the second line and then our fourth vertex, so our fourth point, is where it rejoins the first point. So even a triangle has four vertices. 
so a couple of things we need to be aware of when we're working with vector data and the first is scale so you can see that in the image on the left we've got our lampposts again and these points are relatively easy to identify so we can see the points clearly but it's still quite obvious that they're individual points and where they are on the road uh, you can see even on this though our lampposts are actually beginning to encroach on the road a little bit. Uh, even more so, in the image on the right, the points are basically indistinguishable, and we have our points actually coming the majority of the way into the roundabout and overlapping with each other, which makes them, as I said, indistinguishable. So it's something we really need to think about, and choosing uh, an appropriate size of point is uh, something that we'll, we'll talk about later on in the course, but it's something that you, you really need to think about. Similarly, when we're looking at any sort of vector data, something that might appear accurate at one scale may not be accurately mapped when, it's, when we zoom in, so when we look at um, a more detailed level. So we can see our image on, our, on the left, and the roads look like they're more or less accurately representing our satellite imagery that we have here. However, when we zoom in, so we've got the image on the right, which is just the top of the, the picture on the left and we can see that actually our road is very much off to one side of the main road if we look at the line running from southwest to northeast and therefore it's important that we bear this in mind um, when we're, we're looking at, at this sort of thing and if we were only working on uh, very small scale data so really zoomed out then this probably won't be so much of a point uh, so much of a problem so if we were looking at the entire city it won't be too much of a problem but if we were looking at the, just this group of houses then this might provide us with a problem so scale is something that you have to really think about and it's going to be appropriate to your to what your the area that you're working in similarly in this example we've got the original image on the left but on the right hand side we've got our buildings and if you zoom in on the buildings we can see that Whilst it looks like it's been relatively accurately mapped on the left hand side, um, when we come in and zoom into the buildings it's actually been very poorly mapped and so that's something we just need to bear in mind. Uh, so other problems with vector data, when we're using shape data we might have slivers or overlaps. So what we've got here is we've got uh, some land use data from two different sources and one of the sources has where it has the, the, the area mapped as beach and the other source is supposed to be the water and you can see the white gaps that we have where we have uh, slithers that are missing and we also have areas which are overlapping so at the top we have an area where the beach overlaps with the, with the water file um, and again depending on your scale this maybe isn't too much of a problem and we can fill those slithers and remove overlaps which is something we'll, we'll look at later um, in the course but it's something that we need to be aware of especially when we're looking at where to source our data from and what scale to source our data at. Another thing we can have when we're looking at line data similar to the shape data the polygon data is that we can have overshoots and undershoots so on the image on the left we've got overshoots where the two side routes are extended past our main road and um, on the right hand side we have undershoots where our two side routes haven't quite reached our main road. Um, and this normally occurs when you have badly mapped data or low quality data, low resolution data, but it's again just something we need to be aware of. So we've talked about the negative size but where does GIS data really come into play? So the answer is any way you can think of really. So just the examples I've come up with here, we can look at where a hospital should be placed so it can service the most amount of potential patients. Um, we can look at which houses might be most vulnerable to global warming, so most, might be most vulnerable to flooding or forest fires or landslides. And when we're talking about marine biology, we can look at where populations and marine mammals might be at most risk from shipping traffic. Um, there's countless other reason, uh, other ways we could use it, but that's just one example. 
So hopefully you feel that we've met the objectives of today's lesson, which is to learn more about what vector data is, learn about the different types of vector data. So we've talked about points, polylines and polygons. And then we've learned about some of the problems which we can come across when using vector data. That's it for today's lesson. Hopefully see you soon. Thanks. Bye.